So we've learnt about these incredible explosions of supernovae, and we've got an explanation. It's a white dwarf that goes bang when too much mass somehow gets accumulated on it. So, whole problem solved? Well, I seem to remember you saying that actually there were two types of these things. I mean, what, you don't like the sort of complexity, but you remember some of them, the type 1s, I think you called them, had no hydrogen, and that would be a good match to these white dwarfs. But what about the type 2s, which had lots of hydrogen? How could you get one of those? Do we actually need two types of massive explosion, not just one? Well, it would seem we need something to supply all that hydrogen, and since hydrogen is in short supply on these white dwarfs. And indeed, it is the case that we need something with a lot of hydrogen. And this was demonstrated because such a supernova, a type 2 supernova, occurred in the nearby proximity of the Milky Way in the Large Magellanic Cloud on my 20th birthday in 1987. And here we see an image of this part of the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is the nearby galaxy which orbits the Milky Way, contains about 10 billion stars. And this is an image taken here in Australia uh, before supernova 1987A exploded. And you can see there's a little star there. And then here in February 1987, we see something that's incredibly bright, tens to hundreds of millions of times brighter than the star that ex uh, apparently exploded. So it looks like that's the star that went bang. It is. Now, with the benefit of the Hubble Space Telescope, where we can really zoom in and get above the effects of the atmosphere, we can see what's going on in that part of the galaxy now. And so I'm going to zoom in on that little spot, and this is what it looks like with the Hubble Space Telescope. So a nice close-up picture, and you can see that this thing is what we think is the supernova, and there are two other stars nearby that are quite bright that turn out, because of the blurring of the atmosphere, those all combine to form one star. So what's that one star we saw just the sum of these two? That was the sum of this one, this one, and whatever exploded in the middle. Uh -huh. So if we go through and we look at that star, and we subtract off how bright these two things are, we're left with a brightness of a star. And the brightness of a star allows you to tell its mass. And this star appear, apparently had a mass of about 15 times that of our sun. Okay, so that's definitely saying this is not one of these exploding white dwarfs. I mean, a white dwarf would be much too faint. You imagine it might be the companion star that's feeding mass onto the white dwarf, but the companion star had to be less massive than the, the white dwarf star, otherwise it would have died first, and we need it to die afterwards. So the companion star may be one, maybe two solar masses if you push it, but there's nowhere it can be as big as this. This is obviously something quite different. Yeah, so this is apparently something that is a different family of object. So, how can you get a massive star like this to explode? Well, I think what we need to do is think back to sort of the life cycle of massive stars. So, a massive star, of course, burns hydrogen into helium and helium into eventually carbon, just like our sun does, but small stars sort of run into a stumbling block. It's very difficult for them to burn things beyond carbon because they just can't get hot and dense enough, dense enough. Which is why these normal stars leave us a nice carbon, oxygen, white dwarf behind. Absolutely. So if you're a more massive star, when you run out of that nuclear fuel and gravity takes over, it's able to squeeze it harder. Squeeze it so you can start adding heliums onto each successive nucleus. And eventually you end up uh, burning silicon into iron and nickel. But, of course, uh, that's a, a process that turns out only lasts for a few weeks because it's happening so quickly. It's happening at very high temperatures and densities. But it's a different type of process than burning carbon into oxygen, for example. And this is going to be very final. I mean, once you've got, I mean, if you've got carbon and oxygen, in principle, you can still get bring more energy out of them somehow. But once you've got iron and nickel, there's no way you can get more energy out of that, is there? Yeah, that's right. Because if we remember this diagram that we saw earlier on, this is the binding energy per nucleon, per proton or nutri mm -hmm. uh, neutron. And so what you see is that there is this maximum, which turns out to be right at iron. And that means that when you try to put things together beyond iron, you're get losing, you're essentially, you're, you know, it's going to take energy. 
And if you try to break iron apart, it takes energy. So you're at that maximum spot where you can't really do any more nuclear power. So once you've got a large mass of iron and nickel in the middle here, as a result of this rapid few weeks process, what's going to happen then? I mean, it's, it's going to be very massive, and it's not going to have any more source of fuel, so it would shrink down. You think it might shrink down to form a white dwarf, only this time an iron-nickel white dwarf. But this is a very massive star. We're talking 15 solar masses. And as we saw earlier, there's an upper limit to how big a white dwarf can be, set by the Chandrasekhar limit. If you're too massive, the electrons have to be going f up faster than the speed of light to be able to resist the pressure. So surely there's, that's it, game over. It just keeps on shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until it forms a black hole. That would make sense, but we have to remember that uh, you have... This, these nucleons, protons, uh, neutrons, all combine together to make iron. But in the 1930s, we had that understanding that neutrons themselves would behave like an electron and have their own degeneracy pressure. Yes, yeah, so of course, back in the 1930s, uh, Chadwick discovered the neutron for the first time, and Zwicky then realized, well, hold on a minute, we've got electron degeneracy pressure, when you make something dense enough, the electrons start behaving quantum mechanically. But neutrons should do the same thing. That if you do compress them enough, they too will start behaving like a quantum mechanical fluid and maybe give a degeneracy pressure. And because they're more massive than electrons, will happen at much higher densities. So let's do the calculation and see if this is at all feasible and what would happen if you actually had a star supported not by electron degeneracy pressure, but by neutron degeneracy pressure.